This talk is about how to read pattern reversal visual evoke potentials. This is the latest version. It was done on 2.4.19. The talk is intended for the Clinical Neurophysiology Fellows at Niklaus Children's Hospital. It will be conducted in a question and answer format. The first question, what is your diagnosis? A, bilateral optic neuritis, B, unilateral optic neuritis, C, retrochiasmatic lesion, D, none of the above. The first question that comes to anyone's mind when first analyzing pattern reversal visual evoke potentials is where to start. With this in mind, I have created a chart that addresses this and other issues regarding reading pattern reversal visual evoke potentials. This chart works most of the time. I have labeled this chart the how to read pattern reversal visual evoke potential chart. But throughout this talk, I will refer to it just as the chart. The first step is to find the left eye. The left eye is often labeled OS. The next step is to find the visual evoke potential done with the smallest check. This usually is not a problem since most of the time there's only one check used, which is the check that is being recommended by the Academy. The size of this check is 30 minutes of the arc. Next, we look at the MOMF derivation that in this figure is the first one, as you can see pointed by the arrow. Next, we should look for P100. The P100 in this derivation is often referred to as the sagittal P100 since the occipital electrode picking it up is in the midline. So once we locate this derivation, we look for sagittal P100. Positive P100 is the first positive wave after 75 milliseconds. To make sure that the machine selected the right wave, look at the time legend. In this case, 25 milliseconds. Notice how many 25 millisecond divisions are from the beginning of the recording to P100. So as you can see here, I have signal one, two, three, and four. So the sidal P100 selected by the machine is the correct one. As you can see, and as it was in this case, P100 was correct, correctly labeled. At this junction, make sure that the peaks of the two average fall within 10% in latency and amplitude of each other to confirm the reproductibility of the study. I myself like to see peak and amplitude to coincide with each other, or at least to be not further than five milliseconds 
apart and not more than a few microvolts in amplitude apart. The peaks not being with a latency longer than 10% and with an amplitude not higher or not more than 10% is the recommendation by the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology. So we look for cytal P100 and in this case we found it. Then we must ask ourselves if there are morphological issues. So we must look at cytal P100 again and ask ourselves is the timing in approximately the correct range? Is the shape consistent with the triangular wave? And if the relation with the neighboring peaks are correct. In this case, all these requisites are amply met. So we must conclude that in this case, there is no significant morphological issues. So the answer to this question should be no. Next, we have to determine the exact latency of cytal P100. Going back to the panels, you can see that in addition to the computer selecting the P100, the computer will also provide you with the actual latency in milliseconds. In this case, the latency is 99 milliseconds. Once the latency to P100 is known, we need to determine if it is delayed. And it is obvious from, by looking at this number that in this case the latency is not delayed. This conclusion is achieved by the established upper limits of normal in the laboratory in which the test was performed. So in this case, in the laboratory that this test was performed, they establish the upper limits of normal to be 118 milliseconds. So to the question about the presence of a delayed cytal P100, we must conclude that it is not delayed. And certainly in this case, the value is not in the borderline range. It is squarely in the normal range. Next, we must consider the amplitude of P100. So going back to the panels, we look at the vertical legend. Then we go to the cytal P100 and calculate the amplitude from the peak of N75 to the peak of P100. What the normal range for cytal P100 amplitude is, is debatable and it may vary from lab to lab. I have estimated that cytal P100 values should be no less than 3 
microvolts and no more than 15 microvolts. So the range should be from 3 to 15 microvolts. In this panel, as you can see pointed by the arrow, the amplitude of P100 is 14.6 microvolts. So in this case, we can conclude that the amplitude to, of P100 is normal because it is no less than 3 microvolts. And because it is no more than 15 microvolts. So the answer to the question if the amplitude of P100 is more than 15 microvolt is no. Next we need to look at the parasitical P100 amplitude to determine the difference between the right and the left parasitical P100. Here you can see the arrow pointing to the sagittal P100, which is the one that we have been referring to from the time we started this talk. Notice, as we previously mentioned, that this P100 arises from the derivation going from MO to MF. When the occipital electrode is to the left of the sidle line using the Queen Square system, it is labeled LO and is called the left occipital parasitical P100. The amplitude of this P100 encountered in the parasitical derivation is 10.6 microvolts. On the other side of the mid occipital electrode, we have the right occipital parasitical electrode. The amplitude of this parasitical P100 is 6.1 microvolts. The amplitude ratio of these parasitical P100s is going from the left to the right 1.63 and going from the right parasitical to the left parasitical is 5.7. These values are normal. Now go back to the LOMF derivation. Look at the right parasitical P100 latency. It is 99.5 milliseconds. Now look at the ROMF derivation. The latency to the right parasitical P100 is 101 milliseconds, so the difference is no more than 8 milliseconds, though it is normal. So, after evaluation the parasitical P100s, we must conclude that bearing the left P100 sagittal not being less than 50% of the right P100 sagittal, the left eye study is normal. The next step in the flowchart is to go to the right eye and for this we will go back to the panels as we have done here. We start again but this time we start with the right eye. We go back to the chart and look for the right eye which is usually indicated 
by the letters OD. We follow the same steps as we did for the left eye. First, we determine the sagittal P100 latency. So in the right eye, the P100 sagittal latency is 99 milliseconds. is not delayed we must then ask ourselves if the right sagittal p100 latency is off by more than 8 milliseconds from the left sagittal p100 so the latency of the right P100 was 99 milliseconds and the left side of P100 latency was also 99 milliseconds. So the answer to this question is no. Next step is to determine the sidle P100 amplitude. Here indicated by the arrow is the right side of P100, which has an amplitude of 14.3 microvolts. After determining the amplitude of the right side of P100 and confirming that it is not less than 3 microvolts, and it is no more than 15 microvolts. The next step is to look for the difference between the right sagittal P100 and the left sagittal P100. That is to see if there is any amplitude difference between the right and the left eye regarding the sagittal P100. As you can see, on the left eye, the mid-occipital to mid-frontal derivation has a P100 with an amplitude of 14.6 and on the right eye, the P100 amplitude was 14.3. So the ratio between the left sagittal P100 and the right sagittal P100 is 1.2. And the ratio, now look at, looking at it from the other side, that is from the right to the left sagittal P100, is 0.98. Now we should go back to the chart and we can attest that following this we must look at the right eye parasitical P100 amplitude to see if there is any significant difference between the parasitical P100 amplitudes on both sides of the midline, that is on the right and the left parasitical P100. So once again, we go back to the study. This time we look at the right eye because that's the one we, we have been working on lately we look at the left occipital parasitical derivation and 
we consider or we analyze the amplitude of P100 in that derivation, which as you can see is 11 microvolts. Next, we look at the right occipital parasitial derivation, the amplitude of which is 6.9. With this information, we can figure out the ratio of this parasitical wave. And as you can see, the right to left parasitical occipital P100 ratio is 0 0.62. And the left to right occipital parasitical, parasitical P100 ratio is 1.40. So now going back to the chart, we can answer the question about there being a parasitical amplitude difference. And we can answer that question by saying that there is not a significant difference because it is less than 2.5 to 1 ratio. So now we must make sure that the latency between the right eye parasitical differ by less than 8 milliseconds. For that, we need to go back to the study and look at the LOMF derivation pointed by the arrow and determine the latency to the right eye left parasitical P100, which is 100 milliseconds. We then look at the ROMF derivation determine the latency to the right eye, right parasitical P100, which is 99, thus only one millisecond difference than the left parasitical, thus it is normal. So since the right parasitical amplitude and latencies are normal, the study is normal because no prior abnormality was found. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, N 105 is a delayed and inverted P100, A true, B false. In this frame, the arrow is pointing to the right in 105. Now the arrow is pointing to the left in 105. The in 105 peak is well appreciated using the mid frontal electrode refer to an ear electrode. In this case, it was referred to the left ear. The sites of the generators of the pattern reversal visual evoke potential peaks is a debatable issue, but especially so is the site of N105 generation. In the illustrated manual of clinical evoke potentials, it is reported that the origin of N105 is the prefrontal cortex. A more wild explanation is that at about 100 to 110 milliseconds, the field capture in the midfrontal cortical region is somehow related to a field generated at the superior colliculi. This last explanation has lost ground 
more recently to the cortically mediated frontal origin of N105. In other words, the, the cortical frontal generation of N105 is currently the most widely accepted explanation for the origin of this wave. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. In an adult with a head circumference of 56 centimeters and an ascion to inion distance of 37 centimeters, the queen square system occipital electrode placement coincide with the placement of OZ O1 and O2. A true, B false. In the right eye, as well as in the left eye, you can see in this panel a derivation label MO to A1. And another derivation label OZ to A1. I will explain my reasoning for thinking this is a good idea. In this frame, you have the electrode placement based on the queen square system. As you can see, electrodes are placed 5 centimeters above the inion in the mid occipital region, and two more electrodes are used flanking the mid occipital electrodes. These electrodes are placed 5 centimeters from the mid occipital location. The mid frontal electrode is placed 12 centimeters above the nation. In this new panel, you can appreciate the difference, the different nomenclature used in the 1020 system. In addition, to the difference in nomenclature and electrode placement, we must take into account when using the 1020 system that is actually based on percentage the size of the head. So when we use the 1020 system, we must consider the size of the head in order to decide the placement of the electrodes. This fact is well known to pediatricians because we deal with head circumference of many different sizes. So head circumference and nation to inion distance matter very much when explaining the location of electrodes using the 1020 system. Here I will use a head circumference of 56 centimeters and a nation to inion distance of 37 centimeters. Using this numbers, we will locate OC 10% of the distance between the inion and the nation, that is 3.7 centimeters from the inion that is, as it is indicated in this frame. O1 and O2 will be placed at a distance of 5% of the head circumference to the left and the right of OC, which in this case is 2.8 centimeters from OZ. FC will be placed 30% of the distance from the nation to the inion, which in this case will be 11.1 centimeters from the nation. In addition, both systems, that is the Queen Square and the 1020 system, will use the ears as reference, in this case I'm indicating the left ear, and in this case the right ear. One more electrode will be placed, it will be placed at CC, and that electrode will correspond to the ground electrode. In this frame, you can see 
the 1020 system electrode location. Now I have added the labels for the electrodes used in the queen square system. Here I have superimposed the electrodes as positioned using the queen square system to the previously established location of the 1020 system. That is, I have superimposed both systems in order to represent them better so you can actually see the difference between them. As you can see, I have put a halo in white to those electrodes representing the placement of the Queen Square system. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. If the amplitude of the Seidel P100 is bigger in the OC to A1 derivation than it is in the MO to A1 derivation, the maximal vector of Seidel P100 is closer to the union. A true, B false. Here we have gone back to the panels, which I have shown you several many times during this talk. When using MO to A1 derivation, the contribution of N105 to the Seidel P100 is gone, allowing us to see P100 from another angle, that is from the ear. When using OC to A1 derivation, the contribution of N100 to the Seidel P100 is also gone, but in addition, the searching electrode is placed closer to the union, a location at which the occipital field generating Seidel P100 is often maximal, as you can see in this case. Please notice as pointed by this arrow, that the amplitude of Seidel P100 is larger at OC A1 than it is at MO A1, as we just previously mentioned. So going back to the panels with the values we have placed during the step-by-step -step progression in the chart, we can now populate the area pointed by the arrow. We can populate it with the MO to A1 and the O2 to A1 derivations from the left eye and also from the right eye. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Which of the following findings represent a clinically significant finding? A. A Seidel P100 interocular latency difference of 6 milliseconds. B. A Seidel P100 interocular amplitude asymmetry with a ratio larger versus smaller of 1.8. C, a parasitical P100 amplitude asymmetry with a ratio larger versus smaller of 2.4. D, a sagittal P100 interocular amplitude asymmetry with a ratio larger versus smaller of 2.2. Going back to the table that we have been populating throughout this talk, you can still see you can see that at the bottom I have written normal values. Remember that normal values must be lab specific. So in all fairness, when you take the exam for clinical neurophysiology, they should give you all the values. But it is a good idea to have a general concept of what those values are. 
SI.P100 interocular latency difference of 8 milliseconds or less is usually considered normal in most labs. SI.P100 P100 interocular amplitude asymmetry with a ratio larger versus smaller of less than 2 is normal in most labs. And a parasitical P100 asymmetry with a ratio larger versus smaller of less than 2.5 is considered normal in most labs. So the answer to this question is D. Thank you very much for your attention.